Oh, just give it, give it. Good evening, friends, um, and welcome to uh, the Center for the Study of Developing Societies. Um, this evening, we are um, hosting a um, friend and colleague from Ashoka University, Professor Gautam Menon. Um, I just want to take a little bit of time in introducing uh, uh, Professor Menon as well as his work, uh, especially for our audiences who've, uh, who've, who've joined us uh, online. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, Gautam is a scientist, uh, and he, um, he studied at, um, St. Stephen's College at, uh, the IIT Kanpur at, at the Indian Institute of Science in, um, in Bangalore, um, and has done lots of postdoctoral research in, at various institutions in, in Canada and in the United States. Um, he trained initially as a physicist, uh, moved slowly into biology. Um, uh, as a physicist and mathematician, moved slowly into, into biology and then bioinformatics, um, and uh, subsequently uh, started to do, I think, more and more modeling and computational work. And of course, he's become a very, very familiar figure uh, to, to all of us uh, in the last two years of the pandemic, um, when he's been among the sort of uh, uh, leading um, sort of uh, commentators as well as uh, guides, you could say, uh, to, uh, to, to, to publics uh, all over India and all over the world uh, in trying to look at uh, trends uh, and 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 uh, you know um, uh, sort of responses uh, to the pandemic uh, in this and in other countries. Um, Gautam uh, spent a great part of his career at the Institute for Mathematical Sciences in Chennai, and about three years ago he moved to Ashoka University um, in Sonipat, uh, just uh, near near here, and he. Uh, is a professor there in physics, in biology, um, uh, as well as uh, he heads up a new center that they've set up uh, within the university called the Center for Climate Change and Sustainability. Um, and he continues to do a lot of uh, public work um, um, as far as uh, disease monitoring, modeling, um, uh, looking at transmission, uh, especially, especially of this pandemic, but also at other kinds of, uh, of, of, of disease uh, which affect our part of the world. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, one of the things that has been clear over the last two years is we've, we've, we've been so reliant on um, a number of very prominent doctors, scientists, uh, um, uh, people who handle data and statistics, including journalists, um, you know, we've, we've, we've had to rely on them many times for uh, getting a, a better picture of, of how this disease is uh, spreading and affecting our different, um, different parts of the population, uh, what the real numbers are, and what kind of uh, you know effective or or ineffective response uh, we've seen um, from 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 government and other kinds of uh, public health agencies. So um, along with people like Shahid Jamil and uh, Murad Banaji, who was also a speaker here uh, sometime last year, um, many other uh, Gagandeep Kang, sort of galaxy of of of, of public minded scientists. Uh, Gautam really has been at the forefront of, of, of educating the public, reassuring the public in many instances, um, and trying to correct for some of the uh, some of the some of the sort of lack of information, shall we say, uh, about the real figures um, in terms of the impact of of, of COVID. Um, Today he's here, and, and the reason that we've, we've invited him um, to to, this, to CSDS um, is because he's um, also uh, launched quite recently um, a, a very exciting new project um, uh, called Bharat Sim, which he's going to talk to us about. Um, 
which tries to simulate uh, a synthetic population um, uh, using uh, social uh, and, and, and uh, sort of sociological data, um, and then models uh, through complex uh, programming uh, how this population behaves uh, so as to uh, transmit disease. Um, and that's where, and, and he calls it a wicked problem, which I gathered from him, uh, is a term used in, the, in, the, in, 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 in a lot of uh, the sciences to indicate a problem which has, um, you know, uh, which is multivariate and has, has, is almost intractable perhaps. Uh, it's, it's so complex that it's almost intractable. Of course, as social scientists, I think every problem that we face or that we try to analyze is, is, is really a wicked problem. Um, so, so we were quite, uh, you know, we were quite uh, sort of well able to, to follow the, the connotations of this term. Um, but um, we hope that, uh, you know, we can, we can start a conversation uh, today as well as uh, more broadly in, in the public sphere about, um, uh, you know, how, um, uh, scientific and, and, and computational and st statistical and modeling um, uh, techniques uh, uh, can, can actually speak to and benefit from um, the kind of deep uh, uh, and long-term social knowledge um, and social analysis that um, is, is the hallmark of, of, of an institution such as ours. Um, so we hope to we hope to sort of begin this sort of conversation. And um, Gautam had uh, specifically asked me not to give him a long introduction, but of course, <laughs> I didn't. Uh, I didn't. I didn't follow his instructions. But I thought it would be useful to uh, to to give a little bit of context uh, as to um, how and why he came to be here, um, why he's interested to speak to us, and and we to hear from him. So he'll speak uh, for about, um, I think 45, 50 minutes, 50 minutes. And then um, we have an audience uh, on Zoom, um, on, on Facebook and so on, and people can send questions in um, the chat uh, window and I will um, you know, attempt to, uh, to convey them to him and, and, and we'll take it from there. Um, so we have about, um, I'd say we have about an hour and a half uh, for for the for tonight's proceedings. So thank you very much, and uh, over to you, uh, Professor Menon. So thank you, Professor Vajpay, for this invitation. Thank you to CSES for hosting me here. Come on. I must confess to being a little daunted because I've re never really spoken to social scientists before. All of my talks have been to scientific audiences, maybe to economists once or twice or to population scientists, but never to the quite the same audience that CSTS presents. So I want to give you some explanation of what is my own trajectory to thinking about the problems that I'm thinking about at the moment. And as Dr. Vajpayee explained, it's a somewhat complicated trajectory. I started off in physics. I moved to biology or thinking about the interface of physics and biology. And more recently, it's been epidemiology. And there my interest, where that interest overlaps with what CSTS does, is a broad interest in the social determinants of disease. And this is really, in a sense, a frontier in being able to understand how disease spreads through a population. This is a class of problems called wicked problems. And infectious diseases is my own mm -hmm. pet version of a wicked problem, and I'll explain why. But climate change, which is another thing that I've been involved in studying, is another such wicked problem. And I'll tell you what the definition of how one should think of wicked problems as we go along. I'll tell you a little bit about models for COVID-19 in India, a little bit of background about what is a model, what do models do, what do we know from them, etc. And this is, I will leave out all extraneous detail that you don't need at all to understand, but try to give, give you the general idea of what is being done when someone says we model a disease. And then I will tell you about something that I've been working on for the past two years or so, which is Bharat Sim and applications of Bharat Sim. And that's where really the sort of my intent in talking to this audience comes in and, and where I think that I'd like to be able to interest you in the potentialities that this contains and to also learn from you where social science input can be useful to the sorts of problems that I work on. So my own trajectory, actually, you know, all of us can trace our interests 
typically can trace our interest in something that we happen to be doing now to some pivotal event or some book that we read or an interaction with someone. And, and in my case, it's also very specific. This is a, a small, a short talk of about 15 minutes or 20 minutes given in an institution in India in the South called Jawaharlal Nehru Center for Advanced Scientific Research by David King. And David King is the, was, was at that time the scientific advisor to the British government. And he, this, I was in a completely separate meeting. This gentleman was supposed to come and we, in our lunch break, they carved out about 20 minutes so that he could just tell people what, about what stuff the British government was interested in at that time from a science point of view. And he spoke about two things. One was about the foot and mouth disease in the UK. And this is 2001, 2002, which affected farm animals. And typically about, they had to cull between six and 10 million sheep and cattle to prevent the spread of the disease to all farm animals. This had a huge economic impact and it cost somewhere in the, in the region of a couple of, of billion pounds. And certainly dealing with that was an extremely important public health from a veterinary point of view uh, requirement to understand what to do. And that's where modeling came in very significantly. Do you, where do you cull? What animals do you cull? Where do you look at surveillance or where new cases are rising? And for this, the way the whole modeling enterprise was set up to provide input to governments to decide policy was very instructive. And to, that's where I began to think about the uses of models in policy and to begin to have this idea that rather than policy being developed just out of the air, so essentially through experience that had been garnered by people who sort of seen lots of stuff in the past, but to anchor policy in evidence was something that I thought was a priority. And I didn't see much evidence of that in India. So that was one interest where it started. The second was, of course, this question of climate change and sea level rise. And he mentioned this as another example of, of something that they could see happening over the next 20 to 50 years. And the example that he used was the consequences of a half meter to a meter rise in sea levels. And you can see the map of India in a little part of, of sort of blue color right at the edges and a sort of the larger section of blue in Bangladesh. And this represents the fraction of area and the populations associated with that area that was susceptible to a rise in sea level as a consequence of climate change. And the numbers were somewhat staggering. I mean, these are numbers in the tens of millions, somewhere around 50 million to 60 million people potentially affected by this rise in, in sea levels across these regions. So that's a question of climate science, projections from climate science, but very important social implications. What do you do when you have to move populations of order tens of millions from places that they have inhabited for centuries? And who, who takes the responsibility, who pays for this? Where deal with this. So that was again a second set of problems that I began to realize only were in the general category of wicked problems, which I'll tell you a little bit about. Let me tell you a little bit about, again, I'm going from physics to biology and I, the lessons I extract from each of these. So it doesn't matter what this is. This is just a graph of points on, on, on a graph. It actually turns out to be the temperature of the universe in a sense. This is the, the universe is sending us waves from far away. And this is some representation of, of the energy contained in those waves. That's not the point. The point is, look at the data points that are shown, the little squares that are shown, and look at the perfect line that goes through them. The perfect line that goes through them is that little equation that you see on the top right. And that is the only equation that you will ever see intended so that you pay any attention to it. It's just intended that there is something that generates that line, that provides that line. Look at the points inside. The points are those little squares and they represent each point is an experimental observation. The accuracy with which that experiment is done is such that it is 500 times smaller than the width of the point that is used to represent it. In order to show you this graph, I have to show you a point on the graph so that you can see it. But the experiment itself is far, far, far more accurate than the point that I will show you here. So this is naturally, the fact that physics naturally deals with, with abilities to understand data, such as this physical data, with such a remarkable precision and accuracy to be able to have a form fits this perfectly, and to be able to do an experiment that measures with such extreme precision, the property of the universe at large, is extraordinary. And this is sometimes, you know, the sort of feeling that people from other fields have when they encounter this stuff like this. It's called physics envy. And, and often when I talk to biologists, there is this element of envy involved in saying, how do you do this? I mean, how is it that other sciences are unable to do things like this? If you wanted to look at biological data, this is what it looks like, that picture to the right. And as, as someone who looks at, at biological data from a biophysical point of view, one has to deal with numbers. So this is exactly the same thing of plotting data from an experiment. And you can see those, those little open circles and, and, and the, 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 the filled in circles on the right-hand side. And there is some information obviously here, but that information isn't as clean certainly as the information in the previous graph. So this is 
you know, the, 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 the fact that real biology is noisy and messy and complicated and stochastic in nature is something that is not shared by the very beautiful physical description that I showed you earlier, but in a sense is more intrinsic to complexity, to the, the fact that this represents something that is living, it has an emergent property. So emergence is very crucial to thinking about data like this, as well as the fact that it's robust. So this is data on single cells, as you can see a picture of a cell next to it, and that these are the sort of cells that make you and me up, and we have 10 trillion of these. And the fact that you're alive and listening to me at this point is really a testament to the fact we've been alive for 50 years, although you haven't listened to me for that long, is a testament to the fact that we are these processes that govern us, that govern life, are extremely robust, even though they're as noisy as this. So, so these terms of complexity, emergence, robust, terms that generically are important for the later steps that I will tell you. I'm just gathering together ideas and terminology that I might use a little later. Third example, so this is a line of people that, these are the pictures that you would remember. So it's a stunning New York Times photograph of the lines that formed during the time when we had a, a large scale lockdown in the country. And then migrant labor was then sent back to the many distant parts from which they had moved to the major cities of India, to, to Delhi, to Bombay, et cetera, et cetera. And these are people in line, they're all masked, et cetera. Now, I show you this because one could ask the following question. We had a lockdown. At that time, it was the most punitive lockdown, the, strong, the most stringent lockdown in the world. Did the lockdown in India save lives or not? This is certainly a question that one could ask. And one can then ask, what goes into thinking about this problem? And, and you know, we sort of, this is something that we also thought, worked on. We had a number that was smaller than other people's numbers, et cetera. But then we realized that this really isn't a question you should be answering in the first place. The reason is the sheer complexity of that question or size description. I'm going to count the people who were unaffected by the lockdown otherwise, but who didn't get the dialysis and other types of long-term treatment that they required because everything was locked down. Are you going to count the people who died en route to the places where they actually came from? Because it, there was no, in many cases, people walked 500 to get back there. Are they counted in sick or not? What, what goes into this number? Is it just a, a business as usual scenario? Or the fact that things had changed and you must account for those changes when you think about these problems? So to answer questions, even to begin to think about these questions, you need models that are most, more nuanced. Most models are not particularly nuanced, but they're interesting as devices to explore counterfactuals with the lockdown, without the lockdown, with the COVID-19, without COVID-19, with schools closed, without schools closed, et cetera. And that's really the only important use of a model to be able to look at possibilities and then ask, what happened when this happened? What happened if I had a lockdown? I didn't have a lockdown. I, you know, I, I ensured that everybody was masked versus everybody was not masked because those are guides to public health response in the future. If we are to save lives in the future, we must understand the present. So models are and will always be imperfect guides, always. But you can still ask the question, what should go into these models? How do we improve these models? How do we think about them at a more deeper level? And of course, the question is, can you trust models at all? And certainly the Indian government has, at various points, said nasty things about models. So this is, um, this is Balram Bhargav, who heads the ICMR. And Indu Bhushan said, conclusion from mathematical modeling can create confusion and panic among citizens. And no model has forecast COVID spread properly, et cetera. So, so it's interesting to sort of ask, you know, how bad is this representation? And this is work from us. This is the top line is, is Andhra Pradesh cases across the second wave and the third wave. And then the, the lower two graphs for Karnataka and for India are projections for the Omicron wave that were done before it actually peaked. So over there, you can see that we got it fairly right. I mean, you can look at the graphs on the top in terms of mortality, in terms of when the cases rose and came down, et cetera. So we have the information now into that goes into those models. And the quality of those models is now certainly far better than it used to be about a year, year and a half ago. And the pictures below, for example, our work, work of others, suggested that the peak of Omicron in India should really happen around the 20th to 25th of, of um, of January. We said the window was approximately the 20th of January to the 10th of February. And we said those big cities would peak earlier, would peak much more closer to the 20th. All of this turned out more or less to be right, you know, barring factors that are more complicated in the sense that people just didn't go to get tested at all. So they didn't reflect in the number of cases, but probably this is a good estimation for the true number of cases that were actually there. And the location of the peak is more or less correct from what we know. So that models work. We now understand them far better than we used to earlier. We understand more about the disease than we used to earlier. And we can now begin to incorporate that information as it comes in into better and better models for what might be happening. 
the models work and they've improved, but they're still incapable of addressing nuances that are questions that are appropriately nuanced. And especially one set of questions that they cannot address have to do with the social and economic determinants of disease. So let me tell you a little bit about that. That's where the intersection with what CSDS does really comes in. So here's one of my favorite quotes from, from the German polymath work out. He says, medicine is a social science and politics is nothing else but medicine on a large scale. That's an extremely interesting quote to have thought of like that. And you know, this is part of a general uh, slate of ideas that he developed saying that social inequality could be a root cause of ill health and medicine had to be a social science. So we don't think of it like that. But it's interesting that these ideas that really come back from 150 years ago, emphasize the connection between what we think of as one type of science, clinical science, medical science, and the social sciences. So these, the nature of, of social inequality and how it feeds on to what happens in a pandemic is, can be seen from these quotes. The pandemics are among the four great horsemen that through history have led to greater equality. The other being war, revolution, and state failure. However, it isn't clear that pandemics are either necessary or sufficient to reduce inequality. So let me give you an example of that. So here's a recent report that came out a few days ago. This is good data coming from the US that looks at Black Americans. And it turns out that older Black Americans between the ages of 65 and 74 were five times more likely to die than white Americans within the same age group. Between April and June and 20 and 21, about one in 310 black children lost a parent or caregiver compared to one in 738 white children. Very clear evidence of inequality between these classes of people. So then you can ask what gave rise to it? And this report goes on to say that it's not due to anything intrinsically biological or genetic in terms of these two families, but a predictable result of structural and social realities. Black Americans are overrepresented in essential worker jobs, including practical and vocational nursing. They're more likely to live in densely populated urban areas. They have pre-existing medical conditions such as hypertension and diabetes due to differential access to healthcare and information surrounding healthcare. So I want to now stress bring in the word wicked and to say that understanding the social determinants of disease is really a wicked problem. So let's just go into the, into the terminology of wicked here. The wicked problem is a problem that is challenging or impossible to solve, either because not enough is understood about the problem or the number of stakeholders involved or the number of varying opinions or the economic burden or the impact of those problems with other problems, the connection between that problem that you're studying with other problems. So all of these questions, the sort of data that we looked at that I told you about from the US can are all mirrored in India. And for example, here is a rural report three from, from the Gaon, from Gaon Connection on looking at vaccinations in India, healthcare access in India, in rural India. So rural versus, versus urban divide, a very clear north versus south divide, caste, accessibility, the role of traditional medicine, trust in government, again, is a determinant of, whether, of, of health seeking behavior. All of these problems are really social questions. These are the sort of questions that you would ask in a, in a, in a low PT survey, for example, some of these. But again, they reflect upon the nature of, of, of medicine as applied, nature of disease, as applied to populations across India. Why do people vote the way they do? Again, a wicked problem, which you know, people, people here are very interested in. Many, many complicated reasons, and it's hard to understand what complex of reasons in different parts of the country lead to certain specific types of voting behavior. So that, as I said, you know, physics, biology, and then later to society, the precise quantification of universal laws and the idea that you can approach some of this through a model, that models are useful, that models do provide some representation of what is reality in some, in some sort of general abstract sense. That's something that you can take from physics. From biology, you can take the generic idea that life itself is a complex system, but robustness is a feature of many complex systems. And emergence is really the most important idea, the most crucial idea that connects a lot of sciences together. The fact that not everything is molecules, that molecules must come together in specific ways. And that the phenomenon of life itself is really an emergent phenomenon that is ultimately rooted in molecules and atoms, but is somehow beyond that. And you cannot start from molecules and atoms and hope to understand life. You must figure out the right language to describe stuff that is emergent. And finally, when you talk about society, resilience is a word that's interesting. And the fact that social problems generically, as was emphasized by Dr. Vajpayee, tend to be wicked problems. And the definition of a wicked problem goes back to Ritalden Weber in 1973. So what I want to emphasize and I want to move towards thinking about disease. And I want to move to thinking about modeling of infection as a wicked problem. This 
which has problems, what you might see has emergence in its complexity, and it has vast infinite similarity. So here, the quote, unfortunately, my own from, from something that I wrote myself. There is no more interdisciplinary field than the study of infections from cells and epidemics. The topic that involves crosses basic biology, medicine, mathematics, economics, sociology, psychology, and history, and indeed many more areas of study. So that's the interesting thing. We tend to think of epidemiology of disease as really something that is done by epidemiologists or people specifically interested in vaccines or in cures for disease or drugs, et cetera. But to think about the larger context of disease requires a much broader scope. The economics comes in because the decisions that you make are ultimately guided by the economics that you have. If you're poor, whether you're poor or rich, your ability to control your environment around you differs considerably. The housing you live in, determines where how disease will spread in that new locality. The need, the requirement for public transport or the fact that you're able to drive alone in a car with no one else next to you is, again, affects the nature of disease in your community, in your state, in your country. So all of this comes together. It's not just the biology. It's not just the, the epidemiology of disease. It's not just the clinical side, but all of these different parts that have to fit together if we are to understand what the course of a disease might be. Again, you know, the pandemic increased both economic and health inequality. The wealthy were not only able to keep their well-paid jobs, but also benefited from soaring stock markets and rising house prices. As we know, in the Indian experience from, from the millionaires, from the many, from the few who became sort of even richer than, than they were to start out with, which is already fairly rich to start out with. But low-paid workers were more likely to have jobs in those sectors that suspended activity, including hospitality and tourism. Weaker health facilities in the neighborhood meant mortality rates for them were also higher. They were more likely to work in essential services, nursing, policing, teaching, cleaning, waste removal, all of which occupations they had a higher likelihood of being exposed to COVID-19. As well as I said, the way they had to live, the risk of contagion, more crowded homes, et cetera, more reliance on public transport, all of this added up to create this differential based on economic, based on, on, on social status between people who contracted the disease and people who were able to at least postpone it, if not ultimately prevent themselves from getting it. I'm going to tell you a little bit about disease. So let me just quickly check and see how I'm doing on time. Yeah, I seem to be doing okay. So again, this is just to fill you in on some terminology and just to remind you of some things, of, of stuff that you probably all know, but it's still, I, I will still say it again, very briefly. Diseases have been with humankind for very long. Smallpox was mentioned in ancient Egyptian and Chinese writing and probably was responsible for more disease, more deaths, smallpox, malaria, etc., than all other infectious diseases combined. And malaria and polio have existed since ancient times, leprosy as well, as you remember from old movies. Here's the last major pandemic that the world actually endured in terms, and it had the most serious effect on mortality, and that's influenza, that's Spanish flu that really across, across the world between January 1918 and December 1919, across a roughly two-year period, about, about, 200, about 100 years ago now. So it infected, so the numbers are a bit vague here, but the idea that it infected between 500 million, maybe a little more, a little less, which is about 25% of the world population at that time. And somewhere between 30 and 50 million people died overall across the world. And of that, about 15 to 20 million people died in India alone. 5 to 10% of the population. So 1 in 20, 1 in 10 people in India died. And India was the hardest hit by the Spanish flu pandemic. Mm. It's interesting that there are very, very few records of this. There's some church records, there are some records of this increase in mortality, but there are no photographs, if you would ask, at, 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 of, of this event at all. And given how traumatic this was, so there is some amount of writing around it. From Mahatma Gandhi contracted the Spanish flu, his daughter in law and her young son died of it. And uh, Surikant Tripathi Nirala lost his wife and several members of his family to the flu. He has stories. I mean, he writes of bodies floating down the Ganga. It's sort of eerily reminiscent of what India saw about 100 years later. So here's, here's a quote from him. My family disappeared in the blink of an eye. All our sharecroppers and laborers died, the four who worked for my cousin as well as the two who worked for me. My cousin's eldest son was 15 years old, my young daughter a year old. In whichever direction I turned, I saw darkness. And so these are narratives from 100 years old of a pandemic of similar impact and similar import. Of course, now we know much better the, the origins of the disease, how to treat it, what needs to be done. But you can imagine the, the remarkably traumatic effect that this must have had at that particular time. Just numbers just tell you about the scale of infectious diseases, so 200 million in the Black Death, 56 million in smallpox in Mexico, between, and COVID-19 currently is 6 million. And of course, this number is highly disputed. 
because there are always questions around whether you counted the numbers of deaths correctly. And Murad Banerjee, who spoke at CSDS some months ago, is an expert on understanding mortality undercounting. It's potentially possible that just in India, you might have had a scale of death that was comparable to the 6 million here, in which case that would shift all of the world numbers upward. And we don't have enough reporting from parts of Africa, parts of South America, et cetera. So we really don't know what this number is. The 6 million mortality figure ascribed to COVID-19 currently could easily be in the vicinity of 50 to 20 million, which would then push it into the range of the other major, um, major events surrounding epidemic disease in the past. So this is just this century. We've seen SARS in 2002, H1N1 in 2009, MERS. So SARS and MERS are particularly nasty in terms of, they're both coronaviruses, incidentally. They both come from the same family of viruses as, as, as COVID-19. There's Ebola, which has been with us for the last, it sort of goes up, it goes down, typically in parts of West Africa. And then COVID-19, technically ongoing in 2019. So infectious diseases are caused by something that's a microorganism, a bacterium, a virus, a parasite, a fungus of some sort. And all that you really need to know about it in the context of this talk is that they spread between people. This can either be direct or it can be indirect. You can, for example, touching someone's hand and moving one's hand to one's mouth, touching a doorknob that someone else has touched, sneezing, leaving little droplets in the air that someone later can ingest. So COVID-19 moves through such a route. It's a respiratory route, it's a virus. First of all, and it moves through these tiny little droplets that even when you speak, when you speak, when you sing, when you talk, these are emitted into the air around you. After some time, they will settle or dissipate or the virus will, will, will lose its ability to infect you. But while, this, while these droplets are still suspended in the air, someone can come by, ingest them, and then be infected by COVID-19. So that's just a very quick survey of, of, of disease in, in absolutely the most elemental terms that I can think of. So let's talk a little bit about modeling and what is modeling involved and what is the nature of the work that I do. And models of disease, I want to tell you about what goes into these models and, and try to illustrate for you that there's a strange intersection between models, the computation that is required to make sense of those models, the science that goes into them, and the nature of the social insights that you need to make better and better models. And I hope that will be clear as we go along. So the, the, the most simple and traditional and almost intuitively clear models really start from this hypothesis that it doesn't matter whether you're old, new, old, young, middle-aged, have diabetes, don't have diabetes, you're six foot, six foot tall or four foot tall, it doesn't matter. All that matters when you think about the disease is what is your relationship to the disease? Are you susceptible to the disease? Are you currently infected by the disease and capable of infecting someone else? Or have you recovered from the disease? That's almost completely, it's almost an intuitive way of describing saying that I'm going to rid of, get rid of all other information that I think is extraneous to this question of contracting a disease. I'm not even going to say that, are you less susceptible, more susceptible, nothing. It's just these three little boxes into which I will place everyone. For example, I could take everyone in this room, assuming all of you have either recovered or are still susceptible, you would be in the recovered box or the susceptible box. In fact, the, the terminology box is actually a technical terminology, it's called a compartment. So you can imagine putting people into the susceptible compartment, an infected compartment, or a recovered compartment. And it's only the numbers of people in these compartments that should be of interest. You just want to know how many people are infected at this time, how many people have recovered, and how many people are still susceptible to this. So that's really the understanding that goes into thinking about models. And it, it, it gets more complicated than this, but if you understand this basic categorization, you've already understood a lot of what goes into the nature of modeling COVID-19 or really any infectious disease. And that's sort of in this little set of these three compartments here. And you go from being susceptible to being infected to being recovered. That's a natural trajectory. If you're susceptible now and you come into contact with someone who's infected, you can become infected. After some time, you will be recover. In a small fraction of cases, you may die. And that's sort of accounted for somewhere in the recovered box. That's a little fraction. But that's really all there is, moving people from one compartment to the other. There's these transfers and influences of these compartments. This is called the SIR model. And that's because the S represents the susceptible, the I, the infected, and R, the recovered. And the, 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 the twist here comes from the fact that it's not just simply moving between the compartment, but the fact that you need to come into contact with an infected person if you're susceptible to be infected. So that's that little dotted line that you can see. It's the influences between compartments and the moving between compartments that are important to thinking about disease. 
you can take that, convert it into mathematical equations if you want to do, which I will not do. But just look at that, these three lines. One represents as a function of time. So I have one person or five people currently in a population. Maybe they've come in from the Middle East or from somewhere where, where from China or from Italy, et cetera. This is, imagine that this is India at the time of, at, in, in January of, of 2020, where the pandemic started. And then you can initiate in this population, which is completely susceptible to the disease, so you can initiate the spread of disease. And the susceptible population comes down as people get infected. As people recover, the recovered population goes up. And the infected population starts very small. It's just the one person or the two people who are infected to begin with. It goes, it peaks, and then it comes further down. So it's that nature of that peak. Where is it? How many people are being infected at that peak? That really concerns us when we think about public health as applied to pandemics. And the model is flexible enough that you can say that, look, if I do various things, I can bring the peak down to and spread it out over a longer time. And that's certainly one way in which public health interventions might work. You don't want your hospitals filled up. So you want the peak of that to come down as low as possible. So you might want to intervene in precisely the way that your model suggests to bring the number of cases at its peak down. This is just an example of how it's done, what it actually looks like. And, and really public health interventions are centered very largely on techniques that help you bring that peak down. So these models don't recognize differences between individuals. They don't incorporate the nature of contacts between individuals, either physical or social in any way. They don't incorporate differences in immunity. Maybe you've encountered coronaviruses before, and maybe that makes a difference to how you react to, to the particular, to, to, to COVID-19 when it comes along. They don't incorporate geography, dense locations, you know, less dense locations, rivers that separate a population on this side from population on that side. These, these issues of where people and how people are distributed spatially and their, their relationships with each other are not in these models. Yet they're simple, but nevertheless, they're very powerful as a first pass towards thinking about these problems. And in fact, really, when the WHO does models, when people predict what might happen to COVID-19 in Hong Kong or Australia, India, et cetera, they're really thinking of models of the type that I described to you earlier. But we can now ask, how does one improve on this description? And that's where the social aspects begin to come. So rather than just talk about this boring thing, how many people are there in the box of susceptible, in the box of infected, in the box of recovered, what happens if I begin at the level of individuals? And that's a more granular way of approaching this problem. How do I describe each individual separately, each of their quirks, their heights, their ages, their gender, et cetera, and put it to something that can even remotely be tractable? How do I do that? Think of their age, their location, their immune response. Do I have any information about that? Their economic status, their healthcare access, et cetera. All of this is information that is important to me. It's important potentially to a model that might want to do a more deeper, a more careful, a more granular approach to understanding how disease spreads within the population. So one way to do this is to map out networks of interaction between people, who contacts who, who speaks to who, comes close in physical proximity with who. So you can think of social contact networks, emotional contact networks, transactional, who buys, who sells, contacts, and contact tracing and the contact is, is really a way of mapping out the contacts that someone had a few days ago to understand how disease spread between the people they actually contacted. Sexual, if you wanted to track a sexual, a sexually transmitted disease, you'd have to inquire about sexual contact between people. And then ne these networks then become the primary object of study. How do you map out networks with which people interact? So then I can begin to color these different boxes somewhat differently. The susceptible, each susceptible is not the same, each recovered is not the same, et cetera. They carry with them this memory of where they are in this network, who interacts with who, and how that interaction actually proceeds. So let me get to some work that we've done just to fill you in about, about the sorts of things that we're doing. And then I will talk about Bharatsan as, as a sort of one step beyond that. So one way to think about networks is to make networks of this form and then populate them in, 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 in a way that you consider to be reasonable. You can have people at home who go to work. So there, there's home, there's workplaces out there, there's hospitals that people go to if they're infected. There are rules that govern what happens, that people, once if someone tests positive, then they stay at home, they quarantine themselves, they, they isolate themselves, the family quarantines as a whole. You can then say that maybe some people will violate that quarantine. Maybe five or 10% of the people will say that, look, I'm not, I, my, my livelihood depends upon the fact that I'm not stuck at home. I need to be able to earn in order to feed my family. So they might move out. People who work at hospitals, healthcare workers might be at larger risk of falling ill because they're in contact with more patients. You can all the structures themselves and ask how does this network change and how does disease propagate across the network? 
the stuff that we've been doing based on that, on those sort of networks, is answering this type of question. This is a question that is a genuine public health question that governments ask. India uses two types of COVID-19 tests. One is a sort of gold standard high sensitivity test called the RT-PCR test. And all of you, all of us, have taken an RT-PCR test at some point in the last two years, I'm sure. And there's a second type of test called the rapid antigen test. And that's a quick point of care test. The difference between these is that the RT-PCR test is considered to be the gold standard test. That's a test that you can trust. Whether that's absolutely so is a different matter altogether. But in general, it's believed that these are tests that are right far more than they're actually wrong. The rapid antigen test, on the other hand, is a weaker test. It's a less sensitive test. It can actually go wrong from time to time. And may not, one, if, if you don't have too much of virus in your, in, your, in your body, then it may not be able to detect that. However, the RT-PCR test is a more expensive test than the rapid antigen test. The RT-PCR test is returned to you eight to 24 hours later. The rapid antigen test is a point of care test. You get the result back immediately. So how do these things trade off against each other? When governments decide how much money they're going to put into testing, what is the mix that they might decide between a rapid antigen regime and an RT-PCR regime? This is really an economic question. Ideally, you would like to test everyone with the best test possible, but the more people you want to test, that's where the economics begins to kick in. And then you have to decide, what does modeling tell you about the right ratio of tests that you might want to do? So here is the, that little network that I showed you of people between homes and offices, et cetera. And that little graph is the numbers of people infected, the little peak that comes down. You can ask those questions now in a more granular sense. You've assigned people to homes, you put in information about the sizes of homes, the nature of contacts, the nature of workplaces, all of this now goes into these more detailed models. And then you can ask questions about testing, for example, within this model community that you've looked at. So you know, it, the, the answer is somewhat interesting. It doesn't really matter whether you use a, an RT-PCR or an, a rapid antigen test, provided you test enough. A lot of our work went into deciding how much enough, how much was enough, and what were the economic trade-offs that were involved in this. I, I won't go into this, I just want to describe this as an example of where modeling can influence policy. In this case, policy regarding testing, not just in India, but across a bunch of low and middle income country contexts. Another question, again, a very important question, what happens when schools reopen? And here, you know, will cases to children, what happens to the family members of children, new masking, should states explore different strategies? Should Kerala be doing something from what Delhi does? Or should Bihar be doing something from what Maharashtra does? To what extent can we nuance our approach to this particular problem based on the information that we have and based on the models that we have? Again, so you can sort of do the same sort of stuff, the same networks that you can create of schools, classrooms within schools, the interaction between children in different classrooms, the nature of workplaces, the nature of homes, et cetera, et cetera. All of this is there and enters these models. And we can ask exactly the same question. What will happen if you open schools, given that 40% or 60% or 80% of the population has already been infected or has some fraction of them have been infected and vaccinated? How does these, this information change the nature of this particular public policy decision. Should you open schools? Should you not open schools? And again, you know, we've been saying this for months. We said that in September of last year, that it was the right time to open schools, really across the country. You should expect that cases will rise, but their impact will be fairly minimal. It's better to look for symptoms and to treat those symptoms rather than keep schools closed. Again, something that UNESCO said, that schools should be the last to close and the first to reopen, because the long-term consequences of keeping children out of schools are actually very serious. They have mental health consequences, they have societal consequences that aren't really taken in if you only look at it from a disease perspective. What happens to children, family members, we suggested prioritizing family members of school-going children for vaccination as one public policy strategy. Should the intervention such as masking continue? We said, yes, you can see a very definite synergy between masking and the rise of cases. Should Indian states explore different strategies? We said, yes, and we'll tell you what states should explore different strategies and why, what the logic is behind that. And, eat, and you know, in the questions of did you know, this happen in Mexico, this happened in the UK, et cetera, the experience of each country is unfortunately somewhat different. It's hard to take what happened in, in, in Denmark or in Sweden or in Japan or in China and say that these lessons can be transported en masse to our country. So the questions that, that all of my work over the last two years has centered on is modeling the spread of COVID-19, incorporating specific features of infectious diseases and in the people they infect and using these models to develop better policy. So now that gets into a deeper and, and sort of more intricate question. That's what information do you need to make better models? So suppose you had magically access to all the information you needed about everyone in the population. 
Would that information help you model the spread of disease better? Now understand the social determinants of disease, understand which interventions might work, the level at which they would work, and which interventions would not. And then, of course, if I did have all of this information about everyone in my population, certainly that's an issue of privacy. You know, should I be trusted at all with any of this information in the first place? So then that raises the interesting question of, I could, in principle, take all of your personal information, but do I really need to do that? Can I replace information about the real population with information that is a mimic of that real population, a synthetic population that has, statistically speaking, everything that I might need to understand about the real population, but transplanted into this different scenario where no individual in my synthetic population resembles a particular individual in another population. It's designed to represent features of the real population as closely as possible, but no, but no single individual there can be mapped onto any other single individual in the real population. So if I had that information, I would then take the agent model is very representing each I don't care whether you're old or young or you know diabetic or anything. That is completely irrelevant to me. Then I said I do care a little bit about how people might interact. I care about society to the level of social interaction, to the level of physical contact, and that enabled me to provide some of my new picture of what might happen. The vaccination, which I didn't tell you about, but all of these things can be understood within the context of more specific models like that. But now I'm going to do something even more complicated with the agent-based model. I'm going to put in more and more information into the description. So agent-based models show emergent behavior. And that's something that I stressed as a lesson from physics and biology together, that just looking at individuals alone or just looking at this aggregate number of people susceptible or infected doesn't tell you about. So this arises from interaction, from the complexity of social organization. So what Bharatsam is, the idea behind Bharatsam is that it's really this ultra large scale simulation of agents. And the properties of these agents are drawn from a synthetic population of the type that I described. And it aims to represent both India's people as well as aspects of its geography. So it's a computational model that simulates disease spread. It's called a framework in technical language in the sense that I can model any disease, not just COVID-19, but it's adaptable. I can use, implement various types of interventions. I can shut down one zone in a city. I can open up one zone. I can cut off public transport. I can reduce public transport by 50%, et cetera. And all of this is an exploration of the counterfactuals that enter when I try to model. I can do things that I, I may not want to test out directly by actually doing it because I don't know what the impact is. But here, at least if I trust my model enough and I benchmarked it carefully enough, I can then begin to understand what the implications of those particular actions are on what might imply. So we can now, with Bharat Sim, we can do somewhere between 500, 50, 500, 5,000, 500,000, 50 million agents. And by 50 million, you're sort of getting into the, into the size of a typical Indian state, the size of Maharashtra, of, 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 of Andhra Pradesh or something. At 20 million, you're talking about the national capital region, the size of Mumbai, et cetera. Pune, which we've looked at somewhat carefully, is about three to five million, depending upon where you draw the boundary. So that you're already getting to a level where you can look at Indian states. We pitched Bharat Sim as something that we're going to simulate 1.4 billion people. And that's probably out of our ken at the moment. But it's certainly, though there are no really interesting public health questions that apply at that scale. I mean, it's just more a question of being macho and showing that you can do it. But the real questions are, are, are on a smaller scale that have to do with communities, with smaller regions. So you can look, use Bharatism to study communities, you can study districts, you can study states, and in principle, you could study countries, the effects of migration from other countries, ask what happened to that first set of cases that came into the country, and, and, and look, at, look at all of this complexity as it evolves. And putting this picture back again, you saw this as, as, as a backdrop to my earlier slide. And this is a perfectly, you know, this is obviously a face, someone's face. The interesting thing is that this is a face, that, this is a person that doesn't exist. And this comes from a website called thispersondoesnotexist.com. And they made it melded together by, it, it's, it's not even melded in, in any sense that you might think. It's not sort of brought. And computationally by various machine learning methods that looks at, look at large numbers of faces and then bring them together in interesting ways 
and connect them together to generate realistic looking faces that really could be someone that you might they could meet down the road in the next 10 minutes if you were walking down so that's what i mean by a synthetic population you should really be unable to tell the difference between something like this that really there is no person who looks like this and the real thing you must be able to create something that is believable enough to be useful to you in the context that you want to study but yet doesn't violate the basic privacy of the information that you get from individuals so that's a picture of one of someone who i would call an agent there's no person who corresponds to that picture but his features are all believable features so the attributes that you might want to construct in your synthetic population you might want to say there's an every ID, every individual has a unique id for example individual id 63 years the person is male they're 63 years old they have a certain house id they have a certain work id they have a certain family id that tells you how big is their family is it a four member family or eight member family they're earning less than 5 to 50000 per annum they work in agricultural labor they have diabetes they were infected on such and such a day etc all of this information i can put in into my synthetic population if i knew this information if i was able to actually put it together so there are three parts to the basic parts of my idea. One is a simulation engine. That's a computational part. That's the part that does the heavy lifting of picking up, moving people from point to point, getting them infected, walking them back home, quarantining them, et cetera. You need a synthetic population, which as I said, is the core of everything that we do. Creating a believable synthetic population is vital to the whole partisan program. And finally, you need to be able to look at what you're doing represented by graphs and pictures, et cetera. And that's a visualization part. So the whole, the, the, the scope of partisan is, very, is, is these three chunks that must come together intimately in order to be able to do what it is that you want it to do. So we construct the synthetic population for India using what are called machine learning methods that integrate a bunch of survey data that is available. So gender, age distribution, family size, the socioeconomic data where it's available, healthcare access. We put it together, the National Family Health, Health Survey, other types of information that we can do. We integrate this together to generate essentially a list that looks like this. So for example, a file that we create of our synthetic population might have agent with the number to attach to it, the age, the height, the weight, I think, do they have TB, do they have blood pressure, do they have heart disease, et cetera, et cetera. What is the job label that they have? Are they essential workers? Where do they work? What's the latitude and longitude of where they stay? And you can see it gets increasingly complicated. I can put as many columns into this as I want. The latitude and longitude, I can map then onto a population density map and ask where, the, where, 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 where more people are staying versus less. I can say, are they going to school or not? What is the fraction of people in that area who go, of children mid age between six to 16 who go to school and put that into the model. And all of this really is, is an illustration of what it is that I'd like to do with this. Here's an example of the synthetic population for Bombay for different wards of Bombay and, and what with the actual population densities and the, the, the comparison that we're able to do between the real and the fake, so to say. You can look at the spread of disease in a population like this by just coloring the numbers of infected in Bombay and you know, associated with each of these. This is called a chloropet. And you can sort of run this again and then ask in this big you know, metropolis of, of, of 10 to 12 million people in this region that we're studying. If I see the disease, how does it spread? What determines where it spreads? Which areas are more likely to be more affected than other areas? And of course, as with all of these models, there's an element of randomness and stochasticity. I don't know exactly what's going on. I mean, it's a ran much of disease is random encounters. I walk into a lift that someone has been in earlier and breathed into, and then I, I sort of ingest it. I don't know who that person was. I don't have any contacts with them. So there is this element of stochasticity in the description that I must incorporate. So one way to do this is just to match at different points of time with the actual data on the numbers of cases hospitalizations etc and then say this is the trajectory that, that the disease is actually following Roger, stochasticity. stochasticity is randomness sorry technical word yeah so we can do this for, for we've done some amount of work in pune and then we can do interesting things what happens with multiple strains we've had three major strains in india we had the original wuhan strain that came in this was replaced by something called the the, the b version of that. Then we had the Delta. The Delta hit India very hard during the months of between February and of 2021 and about May of 2021. And then we had Omicron that came and took off a little later in the year. So that we can put that to these models. So this is the number of people getting infected in millions on the y-axis as a function of time and days when you start it off with two variants that come in. You can even do cooler things. You can say that if being infected once 
gave you some amount of protection against the disease the second time, you can think it at 100% protection, then of course, it will be completely flat. But maybe it's only 80% protection or 70% or 20% or no protection at all. And then you can map out these different scenarios that you can get in these cases. You can look at if you had no intervention at all, if you had lockdown, if you had lockdowns and vaccinations, exactly how these numbers would shift. And again, you can look at it in an urban context as we did in for, for, the, for the city of Pune. And we couldn't in principle do it for, for other reasons, other regions as well. So this sort of, as you can see, my interest in these questions, my interest from the social sciences side is how does one construct good synthetic populations? Given that you have synthetic population, what questions could you ask of them? What is the nature of the interaction between society and disease spread? It's interesting here because Asians are able to do things that different conceptualizations of this whole problem of disease modeling can't do. Agents can modify their behavior. You can make computationally the ability of agents to decide what they will do in the next time, do tomorrow versus today. And this is important because the hardest thing to model in a disease is response, is, 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 is the nature of public response. Automatically, if you hear of 20 cases in the building where you're in, you're not going to go out that often. You're not going to visit other people in the building. You've reduced your contacts with other people, not because of any directive necessarily from the government, anything that said that a sort of concerted shift by everybody in the population to do something, but because you as an agent have decided individually to make a decision on the spur of the moment based on the information that's coming into you. So the ability to modify one's behavior based on external input is really what characterizes an agent for me. So this can give rise to emergent behavior. You can have a, a, if you just locked everybody up in a box for 30 days, then of course there would be no COVID-19. So that, you know, you can sort of imagine, span the whole region between different levels of intervention in this case and ask what might happen. And again, more broadly, the moment you have agents interacting, they're drawn from a representative population. You can ask questions that have nothing to do with disease, but have to do with collective behavior. What about voting? What about rioting? That's again another example of how, of, of how social, social phenomena, collective social phenomena can be modeled by, by thinking of them as individual agents that are able to understand the environment around them, to respond to that environment and to change their own strategies. And there's sort of a bunch of interesting examples of, of other applications of how do you evacuate a stadium, for example, the, the big stadium disasters in, in, in the ISOs and in, 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 in the UK, et cetera. How do you structure the exits to the stadium in such a way that you prevent a stampede. Again, you need to think of this as agents, agents looking at other agents, the field of view of what an agent has. And often, and there, there's some very interesting sort of information that has come out of these models. And one particularly counterintuitive of, of explanation is that even if you have two exits here, it's best to put a pillar in between so that any one individual can only view one exit and not both. That's something that's very hard to understand why that would be so. You know, the, the sort of intuition that might lead to that isn't clear. But it's, it's, if you put that into these models, it turns out to be the natural thing to do that people, if you have people crowding to get into different exits, the, cross, the, the sort of crosswalking that you will see builds up larger concentrations of people. And that's what really leads to, to, to deaths in, in, in a stampede-like situation. So that's again, social behavior, emergent behavior, and the right sorts of intervention from the point of view of policy that you can make to understand them. So let me finish up with, and let me just see. Yeah, perfect time. Let me just finish up with, again, going back to the old Riddle and Weber argument, the one that the idea that in the paper that introduced the idea of a wicked problem. And that's a, that's a sort of you know, the argument against this. And it says, it says for scientific, the search for scientific bases for confronting problems of social policy is bound to fail because of the nature of these problems. They are wicked problems where a science has developed to deal with tame problems. And policy problems cannot be definitively described, okay? So again, very important lines. In a pluralistic society, there is nothing like the undisputable public good. There is no objective definition of equity. Policies that respond to social problems cannot be meaningfully correct or false. And it makes no sense to talk about optimal solutions to social problems unless you impose very severe qualification on what it is that you're trying to discuss. Even worse, there are no, in quote, solutions in the sense of definitive and objective. So that would be a sort of rational social science response to some of what I've been talking about. I've been talking about models, quantitation, computing, to things that are far more fuzzy and unclear 
in any sensible way of thinking about it, then the way that I've tried to describe it, propose one point of view to you, that it may be fruitful to think along these lines, but certainly there are strong arguments against it, that this may just be a pipe dream, nothing may be possible in this regard. So just to, I mean, just to sort of give you a, a counterpoint to a counterpoint, what we're looking for is understanding and not necessarily solutions. And that's the first thing. We want to know what, what might work, what, what happens, what happens when agents think differently? Can I make them think differently? What happens when I try out interventions, try out counterfactuals? Can I explore the whole different regime, the whole different you know, arenas in which I can confront my agents and thinking of them as really as members of society and see what might actually evolve? We know that these properties are emergent, that they really arise out of collective action. And that's something that we now know much more about now than we did at the time when these, when these people wrote the article about Pickett. We know far more about complex systems than when Rittle and Weber wrote their piece. Mm -hmm. Apart from that, these are interesting questions in their own right. I'm interested in disease. And it turns out now that, these, that, that my thinking about disease has to expand if we are to be able to approach these problems. But just from the point of view of social sciences and computational social sciences, they're interesting in their own right. And again, you know, as CSTS, I'd, I'd, I'd sort of interested in knowing if, if, if there is a resonance at some point with the, with the possibility of thinking about social problems from this unusual and somewhat different angle. So Bharat Sim is an unusual way of approaching certain classes of questions in social science. It's never been tried before in India. The whole question of infectious diseases is a testing ground for whether something like this might work at all. And then you can go back and look at the data and do conduct surveys, et cetera, and see were these predictions correct? Did, they, did it actually pan out or did something else happen? And if something else happened, can we put that something else into the model and make it better and more representative? But it's not restricted to that. And I guess that's really my bottom line. There is a need for better synthetic populations. Once the more I can improve my synthetic populations, the, the easier it is for me to be able to design specific types of studies that are more targeted and potentially more impactful because I know more about those populations a priori than I might that, that, than I, than I might have known if I was just going blind into the field. And finally, all of this is constructed so as to be a resource. Bharat Sim will come online within a few weeks. The papers that describe Bharat Sim will also be made publicly available. Anybody can download this. Some computer knowledge, they can figure out how to run it. As long as 10 million people don't write to us, we should be able to respond to them and, 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 and tell them how to run the program and so on. We are happy to collaborate about questions of concern. This is especially in areas that, that are not our own core expertise. In the spirit of open science, as I said, all of this will be publicly available. And the advantage of it being publicly available is that you can correct things that are wrong. If, if this is obviously a, a wrong assumption or someone goes back and says, we did a survey in this area and your, and your synthetic population is, believe me, completely wrong. We can go back and correct based on that survey. So we're still trying to figure questions out of how do you integrate multiple surveys that people have done? I mean, people have done lots and lots of surveys in India over the last 30 to 40 years. All of this potentially could come in. We don't want to know anything about the person, anything about the details of that. Is it possible for us to incorporate that data into the synthetic population without infringing on privacy at all? We, we don't want to see it at all, but is there a computational way of extracting that information that eliminates the need for anyone on either side to actually look at that data? Can we build up synthetic population as a resource overall for a larger scope of studies of the type that I described and potentially even more? And other new and interesting questions that have not occurred to me at all that you might be thinking of and that we could potentially discuss in, in the days and weeks and months to come. So let me just sort of finish off with, I mean, the, this is work with a large number of people from across the country, from being funded by multiple sources, the Gates Foundation, the WHO, the Emphasis, the Institute of Mathematical Sciences, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That little picture to the right is a baby called Lockdown. Lockdown was born during the lockdown in, in, in Jharkhand. It's a very sort of, and that's just to illustrate a fact that I have to be drawn back to thinking about that disease is not a question of equations and computers and so on, that there are social consequences to, to what governments do in response to that disease. And it's, in, it's incumbent upon people who think about this from a policy point of view to ensure that they have the best tools available to think about this. And, and I think that really is, 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 is an important point to me. Let me thank you all very much for your, for your attention and patience. That, Bring your 
digo que nada. No. So I don't need this anymore. Huh? Okay. So I should leave it. Oh, I need it to see the questions. Okay. Thank you. Oh, I don't know what I dropped. What did I drop? Ah, oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Gautam, for a uh, very, very interesting. Uh, I mean, I had a sense that it would be interesting, but really, um, you know, you exceeded even my uh, my expectations. Um, it's very thrilled to see that, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's more interesting than you simply uh, looking to talk to us about the importance of social knowledge and uh, social analysis to your uh, computational and modeling efforts. Um, I think many, many aspects of, of what Gautam said probably spoke to many of us. Um, first of all, the idea of wickedness and of wicked problems as being large, complex, multivariate, and intractable in a sense problems. Um, I, I expected you to talk about privacy and you did, and that is of great interest uh, to, to those of us who are concerned about rights uh, and the connection between you know, democracy and, and the right to privacy. Um, um, you also spoke about um, the, in, the, the kind of threshold where uh, thinking about public health has to also confront the question of thinking about the public good. And, you know, those can be compartmentalized, but they really should be thought of together. Because as you said, um, you know, in a, in, a, in a pluralistic society, it's, it's difficult to really pin down what the public good is. It's depend, it depends on which public or which, which uh, kind of subgroup within the public from whose perspective, addressed to whom, and so on. So that becomes a very complicated question, the interface between the public good and public health. Um, very, very interesting to me was what you said about emergence. And I know that you, know, you use that to describe the difference between physical and biological systems, but then you took it even further uh, to look at um, you know, what happens when there are networks, when there is interaction between individuals in a biological system. Uh, and that effectively means that we're talking about life itself and social life. Um, and all of that is emergent. Um, and, and this is something that, you know, we use very much in, 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 in political theory and in, in social theory of various kinds. So um, I think that's something that you know, we can all think with um, in terms that make sense to us and, 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 and not just to you. Um, um, I, again, appreciated very much uh, what you said at the end about putting this, um, uh, making this open access a public resource and uh, practicing uh, open science, uh, which I think, again, is something of, of interest and importance to us, partly because we've had um, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, we've used Creative Commons and so on uh, very much, especially uh, under rubrics like Sarai, which have been a part, a big part of what, what the center does. But also, uh, you know, how, how we look at uh, election surveys, uh, political data, et cetera, that or political uh, public opinion data, um, you know, so, so the openness of, 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 of uh, data, the sharing, uh, uh, of, of information, creative commons, uh, you know, those kinds of licenses, um, and, and really knowledge as a public uh, resource, uh, whether it's social scientific knowledge or it's, it's scientific knowledge. And so I appreciate very much, uh, you know, what you said about putting Bharatsim uh, online and, and, and accessible to, to one and all. Um, of course, there are, there are more particular areas of social science that, um, you know, I would like perhaps us to have a conversation about in another iteration maybe of this talk, um, which have to do with, you know, um, basic 
I would say today basic ideas of biopower and biopolitics. Um, uh, and of course, also now biocapital uh, that have emerged through, uh, you know, the work of Foucault mainly, uh, but are more and more and more uh, preoccupying uh, those of us who, who do a certain kind of social science. Uh, where you are looking at collectivities, you are looking at life itself uh, and the management uh, of that life as an essential feature of uh, state power, um, you know, uh, uh, and sovereignty as such in, in, in the modern world. Um, and there, I think, you know, we really have a, a lot to talk about. Um, because, um, uh, you know, the manipulation and the management of life uh, easily goes over, as, as many scholars have shown, into um, really managing um, death um, and, 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 and looking at, uh, you know, the limits to sovereignty and, and conversely the limits to rights. Um, and finally, of course, you know, again, something you said at the very end, um, you know, about in a pluralistic society, what is, you know, what it's harder to determine what the public good is. Um, it, it made me think that you can only have perfect social information in a totalitarian society. You know, you cannot really even have it in a democratic society and you certainly cannot be using it, uh, you know, uh, in any monopolistic way. Uh, there are issues of consent, there are issues of privacy, uh, you know, there are issues of, 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 of right, uh, you know, the right to life itself. Um, so, and, and where, wherein does that reside? In the individual, in, in the state, and so on. Um, so you've really put a lot of important questions for us to, to think about. Um, and I am now, um, you know, going to share with you uh, questions uh, that will come in, we hope, uh, in the chat box. And if they are taking some time to do that, then I'll invite um, uh, members of our live audience here to, uh, to please uh, go ahead. So, um, Professor Sharon, you had your hand up. Professor Banerjee, you had your hand up. Um, uh, uh, yeah, let's, let's just go around the, go around the room. Well, in the spirit that Dr. Ananya is introducing us, Professor Menon, thank you for a very wonderful talk. Uh, I had three comments. I'll keep them very brief. Uh, one had to do with wicked problems and disease. My sense is that much of the attention that is paid and was also there in your talk is what would go, you call social determinants of disease, somebody else would call it preventive medicine, that side of the wicked problem. What does disease do to society? That side remains unexplored. So that having done all the wicked problem side of social determinants, eventually the purpose remains, how do you reduce the peak? So if you think of AIDS and racism, you know, that kind of question still gets left out even when we are thinking about disease as a wicked problem. So something, your reflections on that side of things. The second had to do with, with modeling and policy. Uh, it's my sense, and now there's a fair amount of literature out, that modeling and policy go together when there's something in your face. So it will work for an infectious disease, but precisely for that reason, it does not work for climate change. Uh, so that it's very slow response, even you can present all the data that you want, but very slow response, both policy and societal response to the risks of climate change. So again, something is there a more complicated story of modeling and, and policy making. Uh, finally, on that synthetic population, in addition to all the other uh, interesting issues that there are, uh, did I get a sense or did I rightly get a sense that it seems that the agent remains an individual rational agent and that group dynamics are going to be very high, very difficult to build into a model like this. So how does one account for the fact that much of what we do is not necessarily as individual rational agents? Oh, great questions. 
So let me start with the last and then move backward, if I can remember the first one at the end. Um, you can make agents as irrational as you want. You can, that's a nice thing about, uh, about agent-based models. They're unlike sort of classic economic models where you assume that this person is infinitely rational and has infinite memory for what's happened in the past. You can make your agents, some of them can be rational, some of them can be irrational in ways that you prescribe. You, may, you can even put in someone who switches between being rational and being irrational, time of day, circumstance, etc. All of this flexibility is there with the agent. That's what makes him powerful. That's what makes this whole approach to the end. In fact, in economic modeling, in financial modeling, increasingly you see approaches that are based on this. You have this distribution of agents with different types of, of, of levels of rationality that make decisions. And you see collective behavior that emerges from them. You can get collective behavior, and that's the important thing because agents are responding to other agents. So the central requirement for collective behavior is the ability to interact and the ability to modify behavior based on that interaction. That an agent can do. And a bunch of other studies on the social sciences side of how a small number of fanatics can cause a large scale shift in, in societal behavior, societal perception. All of that has now been, I mean, there are papers that deal with that particular question, terrorism, et cetera, et cetera. But why is it that relatively small numbers of fanatics are able to create large disruptive changes? These are again questions that people who work in this area have been looking at. So I don't think I, emergence isn't a problem and the assumption of, of rationality of agents is not a problem either. That, both of that can be sorted out. The second question was about climate change and the fact that there are some problems whose, which are not immediate in your face problems, but are sort of play out over a much longer time scale. And the problem there is that we are not accustomed to thinking of things over that time scale. So we tend to discount the future as, as opposed to what's happening to us here and now. That is a problem. I mean, I don't sort of pose this as a solution to any of that. I say that, um, or, or, or even any way of, of improving upon that particular situation. I'm just using this, that, my climate change examples would be much more practical examples. If the temperature rises by 0.5 degrees across some parts of India, that's expanding the range, for example, for malaria and dengue, because these mosquitoes can now occupy larger regions of, 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 of the country than they could earlier. What are the consequences of that? How many more cases would we expect of that? And can we do something about it now because we anticipate those changes in the future? You know, the whole problem of sea level rise and migration is something that's very interesting to me personally as a sort of point where society and sort of modeling that I do and climate change really interact with each other. I have no idea how to do this, but in, in potentially that's, that's, that's something that, that again is, is really sits at the intersection of these multiple problems. So short answer is, I don't think this would provide a solution to that particular case. It may be descriptive. It may be useful in very specific contexts in terms of really of disease, the way I think about it, maybe in terms of sort of social changes, if I can figure out what societies might do if the temperature went up by 0.5% or by, by 0.5 degrees over a period of 20 or 30 years, or if rivers began to dry up, that's the nature of water scarcity. All the glaciers melt, polar ice cap, rise of water. I mean, we, many of these are question marks. Say why I brought in climate change <laughs> is, is one way of approaching uh, the social sciences would be that there's a way in which uh, natural uh, physics or biology and those knowledges and social scientific knowledges can work together, have a dialogue to produce something which eventually comes together and, and it helps improve the model. And that's a very perfectly valid exercise. But the other issue that also remains and, and we need to address is what happens to powerful ways of making sense of something uh, which a model can't predict. So for instance, sea level rise. Why is it that this has been privileged so much over inland heating and moisture, which, which increasingly people are saying will probably kill more people than sea level rise. So, so you know, there are these two kinds of dialogues that we can have. One is around how do you improve the model? The other is, how do you use the science knowledge and look at how certain things are being privileged? Yeah. That's absolutely right. And the only way around that is really the sort of dialogue that we're having in the larger dialogue between people who work in these on the more scientific side, the modeling side, et cetera, with people on the social sciences side who are able to raise precisely those questions. Why are you concentrating on this as opposed to this? And this should really be more important over the next five decades and then the problem that you're considering. And often that's a problem with people who think about it from a purely scientific point of view, that they don't see these larger 
sort of social changes and, and social implications of what it is that they do and may just be working on the wrong problems. And I think it's really very important to have the discussion so that we understand what are the problems that we should be working on and we come to some consensus on that and then we retool in order to be able to address those. What is your first question, Deepu? Can you just go over that? Very specifically, around, specifically around disease. Yeah. Where the, you know, my father is a doctor, uh, father-in-law, sorry. And he told me the guy who taught preventive disease was the guy who was the least respected in the entire fraternity. So since then, there's been some recognition that there is something called preventive side of disease. There's something called environment that you have to care about, et cetera. I'm still not very certain if in describing disease as a wicked problem, we take enough cognizance of what does disease do to society? And social relations. Yeah, no, that, 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 again, that's a great question. I was thinking about when I talked about disease, I was thinking about stuff that is, these are called novel diseases. So three out of four emerging diseases right now are diseases that come to us from animals. They're called zoonotic diseases. There's no way of, of really preventing that. And that happens because of the changes. We've changed ecologies drastically. We're cutting down forests. The traditional ecological boundaries that existed between human beings and the environment has now been degraded, eroded. So we really don't know what might be the next SARS-CoV-2, what might be the next MERS, where it might come from. So these are diseases that because they're not natural to human beings, just emerge out of nowhere and can potentially infect everybody and kill 20% of the world's population in some worst case scenario. We actually let it rip. Preventive medicine can't do that. Can't, I mean, it can address standard problems that we know well about. We can, you know, the standard questions of, 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 of diabetes or cardiovascular disease, lifestyle changes, et cetera, that deal with that. But they cannot address stuff that is completely new. And increasingly, I fear that the problems that we will be confronted with will have to do with completely new diseases that we haven't seen earlier. So I view this as one part of it. And certainly, you know, the importance of preventive medicine, the importance of thinking about, about social determinants of, of, of health status is exists, you know, long before I even thought about Bharat, some of any of these things. And they're absolutely crucial. And it's important that we do that. But this, I think, should, could go in, in parallel with that. And it's also useful to understand the interactions between these things. For example, diabetes and COVID-19 infection. Diabetes predisposes you to a worse outcome of a COVID-19 infection. And you know, India has the second largest number of diabetics in the world, second or first, et cetera. Again, major public health problem over the next 20 to 30 years. How will that specially disadvantage India if something like if, if SARS-CoV-2 was to mutate further so as to be able to infect us even better, et cetera? And then what would happen? So there's also an interaction between what we know well that preventive medicine can address and potentially new things that might happen. You might want to understand what's special about the Indian population as opposed to any other population. Where can we intervene correctly and appropriately to make sure that we have a healthier population? Great question. Yes, um, thank you very much. This is really thought provoking. And uh, so as expected, very lay questions, uh, but picking up on the last point that you made right now, would you have imagined in this context of zoonotic diseases, synthetic populations as including multiple species rather than only humans? Now, that's a question that struck me as primary. Uh, uh, and of course, uh, you know, in India, as in many other parts of the world, we coexist with multiple species, both visible and microbial. Connected to that question, uh, what strikes me is um, whether the imagination of a synthetic population would differ across the objects of engagement, uh, as it were, in the sense that the idea of a synthetic population when we want to understand COVID-19 will be very different from the idea of a synthetic population where we want to understand not just climate change, but even a bacterial disease and not a viral disease. Um, in other words, is a synthetic population, unlike earlier statistical imagination of abstract populations via social categories, is synthetic population necessarily a plural and constantly evolving uh, analytical category, as it were. Um, and then, if we say so, that the imagination of synthetic population 
will change depending on what we are studying or what the emergent problem of today is, then the question of uh, the kind of data that you are proposing, which is a very real, unreal data, and that, that's, that's the argument that you're making uh, in order to kind of prevent the privacy invasion question. Um, the relationship of that kind of data with other forms of data that we work with, namely the classical statistical data of census and national sample survey, et cetera, et cetera. And the constantly being generated big data, which is very much what the other kinds of apps of location tracing and contact tracing were doing at this time. Is that relationship also not a relationship that we need to think through? Because the indexes that you are putting into your, as, as your criteria of a synthetic population are indexes that are either representational, meaning statistical, or drawn from invasive forms of surveillance data, which is what the state is acquiring. Uh, so is the privacy question only being postponed or, uh, you know, are we only kind of stepping back from the privacy question or, you know, the relationship between multiple kinds of data and samples. And, and I really like the point that you made about why scale is, I mean, this is the point that the Loknithi guys here also make repeatedly, that it's not as if, if you have a two lakh sample that is going to be more representative than a smaller one. So, um, so you know, so, so the relationship between big data, constantly being generated data to standard classical data, that's the story that I'm not very, I don't quite grasp uh, fully. So I wanted your thoughts on that. And so, so then the other, sorry, I'm just thinking with you. Uh, whatever, last question. The kind of literature that some of us have been reading quite a bit uh, regarding mathematical modeling and computational, uh, especially in context of predicting uh, new diseases, one kind of model tries to simulate viruses. The other kind of model, the one that you're proposing, simulates humans. Uh, um, and the, in both cases, I think prediction and overriding uncertainty is the impulse. So what is the kind of stuff that's going on in predictive uh, sciences in the, on the viral side and predictive sciences on the human side? So, okay. oh, oh, great question. <laughs> And yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So the, 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 can we think of things, other things that are agents? The answer is yes. And one thing that we did think about and began to set up a little bit was mosquitoes and human beings and to try and understand dengue. So we, we have some data on dengue across the months and how that depends upon temperature, rainfall, humidity. If I can tell you what I expect my, my weather projections are for the next 12 months in the city of Delhi or Ahmedabad or something, and what, you know, what, what humidity I expect, based on historical records, whatever method I have, can I tell you how many cases of dengue there will be in a particular locality in September or October? And that will enable hospitals to plan, that will enable drugs to be set aside for that. That certainly would be, I can treat mosquitoes like agents. That may not be the optimal way of doing it. There are other ways, other technically different ways of doing that. But certainly we have thought about it. And livestock in India is another livestock diseases. You can treat livestock as, as, as animals. You can treat you know, factory farm, large factory farms, poultry, et cetera. You can treat them as agents and try to simulate how disease moves between them and a per human being who works on the same farm and comes into contact with them or how likely is it. For some of the stuff, agents are overkill. I mean, mathematical models are actually powerful ways of dealing with a lot of this, this equation that you write down. You don't really need to go through the agent, through the agent route that I described. If the agents are interesting when they're humans because they have a lot of complexity associated with them that is really not there. I mean, a mosquito is a boring object. It's, you know, it's sort of viruses are not. So that, that comes to your third question. At what point do we talk about the nature of the pathogen and interesting things that are happening on the pathogenic front versus a human being? And that's a sort of parallel 
piece of work. We don't deal with that at all, but we could in principle. You could, there are well-established computational and, 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 and bioinformatic techniques that look at how the virus might change, look at mutational hotspots, see what parts might change. The difficulty there is figuring out what changes lead to large, to, to an increased ability to infect or what changes lead to, to an increased severity of the disease. We don't know that yet. Those, those are generically harder questions to answer because these are all said and unfairly complex entities. And we don't know how combinations of mutations might work in changing, in, in sort of changing this, the nature of the disease and the way it, it, it affects people. So if we knew that in principle, we could put that in here. We can say that, look, across this time scale, we expect sufficient changes to accumulate. And some fraction of these will be worse for human beings, watch out for them, do surveillance, et cetera. And if it came along, then this is what would happen in the human population that we simulate through agents. So the, the middle question that you asked was about the populations themselves and, 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 and the way you we, we think about them and the fact that questions of privacy regarding populations, the collections of data, et cetera. What we now have is a large number of columns. So what we had, I showed you a line list, each individual saying, you know, disease, this, that, et cetera, age, income, and so on and so forth. To the extent that that is, contains information that is relevant across a cross-section of diseases, you should be okay for the specific disease question that we're trying to answer. We already have a lot of information in there. And this is information that, for example, a doctor might ask in, 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 a, in, in, in an examination to find out what is the risk chances of your of your being infected by something or the other, what is your predispos predisposition to a particular type of disease. So to that extent, I think we are covered. And we could always add further columns as, 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 we, as we went along using the same types of techniques. We already have a fair amount of complexity. The trade-off there is just sheer complexity and how many things you can put in a computer memory at a time. Much of this may be irrelevant to the disease. We're putting it there because we want a record of it but we may only deal with columns one, two, five, 10, and 20 out of 230. But we want to have all of them there just in case we understand that, look, this particular column that we left out is actually crucial to understanding the disease. So that's why we want as general a synthetic population as possible when we construct it. Questions of privacy and large scale data collection, it's sort of hard. I mean, the, sort of the data that has been, you know, hasn't been shared with us, but we've, we've discussed with various government agencies, is all fairly well anonymized. So we don't know where it comes from. You know, general patterns of motion, general people moving there. But the way the data are provided, people have been fairly conscious of this. The government, of course, knows everything. But usually, I mean, by and large, privacy protections have certainly improved to the level that, look, I can say that I want to have nothing to do with the data if it's telling me about any real person. Therefore, mask it in various ways before you give it to me so that this question doesn't even arise. And it's important if I apply for, for an IRB clearance or something, I have to be able to prove that I have nothing that, that, that can identify an individual at all. So in a sense, it's both what the requirement I will put on the people who are providing me with data, as well as the fact that they also have to be conscious of privacy protections when they provide me the data. We're all slowly evolving to understand these issues better. As I said, government knows everything about you, but I would prefer not to know anything about you beyond the fact, completely anonymous information that I cannot track to anybody. That would make me happiest when, if I had to do this. And I really would think that we would have to think, we would probably not accept it, any, any, anything that could identify an individual. Um, yeah, I, I mean, uh, so, sorry, Cliff, just before we go to you, I just wanted to, uh, I want to add to my list of, you know, things that we have to talk about, I think, um, you know, this question of um, the uh, invasiveness of, uh, of these um, data gathering techniques, uh, surveillance, uh, the surveillance state, uh, you know, big data in general. Um, and I think we've seen a lot of this to the forefront uh, because in the last few years, we've had the right to information and the right to privacy both be debated uh, uh, legally and, and uh, you know, constitutionally and so on. Um, and we've seen for the first time, uh, the Indian state use, uh, uh, you know, uh, what do you call them, tools like Aadhaar or Arogya Setu or Coven. And I would imagine that 
you know, uh, maybe Bharat Sim has a similar kind of scale in terms of what it, as you said, you know, ideally you want to have 1.4 billion if that's the population. Um, the only difference being the, you know, between the, the real and the unreal um, and so on. Um, only one more thing I want to add to what, uh, you know, what Pratima said was um, this question of agency, right? Which is again, absolutely central to the social sciences, right? Um, and what is an agent? I mean, we are interested in, in agents uh, politically and socially speaking, and in terms of, again, uh, how empowered citizens can be, but you know, you have a very different conception of agency. Um, uh, and also of group behavior and group dynamics, right? Crowds, uh, mass, you know, uh, the people versus individuals. I mean, that is again, the heart of the debate in, 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 in democratic theory in liberal theory and so on. And, uh, you know, you come to it from a very interesting angle, I think. Um, um, yeah, and um, uh, finally, I just, I, it just occurred to me that actually you talked about moving from physics to biology and from, you know, one kind of representation to another in terms of the granularity of the data. Um, I was just thinking that viruses themselves are on that. Uh, they, they're not quite physical and they're not quite biological or they're a bit of both. So they're not exactly purely biological, right? Um, so already when you're dealing with viral agents, I, I suppose, uh, all of that is built into, into the very primary building block of your of your problem as such isn't it that you don't even know whether it's 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 a physical system or a biological system or in some sense both uh, and to that extent it, it mirrors um, it mirrors uh, many other aspects of this problem I'm not I don't even have the words in which to express this properly maybe you understand a little bit um, but I, I'm, I have to let Cliff ask a question then and Ravikant, Vaidik, and there's one person who's uh, put in a question here, somebody called Atiyab Zafar, but they have a fairly uh, simple question. So I'll just leave that to the end. Thanks very much. I really appreciated your talk. It was fascinating. It's an area that is very unfamiliar to me, but I really like the way you brought in so many different fields uh, and it's very bold of you, <laughs> very brave actually. Um, I'm someone from political science, and of course, the political side of all of this uh, really most interests me. I'd have to say at the start, I was uh, pretty, uh, I guess I, I'm someone who would kind of believe in what uh, was it Riddle and Weber, Weber say about the problem of ever determining like the common good in a pluralistic society. I think that's a huge problem. Um, but uh, that kind of relates uh, to a couple of questions I have. Um, I, I, I'm wondering if you have thought about how modeling can be used and misused by political leaders in the context, especially of uh, situations that are portrayed as crises or uh, emergencies. Um, and of course, I, I'm thinking about what we've all just been through and really still are going through um, with regard to COVID. Um, and I, I'm sure you're aware most uh, about you know, the, the uses of the Imperial College model that came out in, I think it was mid-March of 2020 and predicted enormous numbers of deaths in the UK and in the US, uh, came out a week before another model put out by Oxford University, which had much, much lower figures. But the media latched onto that Imperial College model, which as I recall, did have a range of different scenarios, but the most um, extreme scenario was latched onto by the media and then immediately by top political leaders, at least in the US, uh, which then kind of had a cascade effect. Uh, top, not only, not, I shouldn't say political leaders, uh, obviously Trump latched onto it, but more importantly, bureaucratic leaders like Anthony Fauci, I think used those as a basis then for a, radically new type of intervention against a, an infectious disease where we were trying to uh, quarantine healthy populations rather than 
quarantining sick populations. So I'm, I would be interested in your thinking a little bit about how modelers like yourself, what responsibility modelers like yourself, or in this case, Neil Ferguson of Imperial College might have had to say to people, you know, don't focus on the, the worst case scenario. I had a whole range of them. Uh, and, um, in, you know, that might have helped the Oxford uh, modeling, which was much closer to the mark, I think, in retrospect, uh, gain the traction it had, uh, it, it probably should have had. Um, related to that, it, it seems that um, your model and a lot of other models focus only on one issue, basically, as you said, the social determinants of disease or disease spread. Um, and yet, when they're used in politics, you have policy interventions that have enormous implications. So what often is done in policies, especially in uh, times of non-crisis, but frankly, in times of crisis, it should be used as well, is uh, cost-benefit analysis to the best possibility uh, to, of knowing what are the costs of intervention. Do the benefits of the intervention actually outweigh the costs? And it, it's striking, as many of you may have seen this, but just yesterday, Anthony Fauci said on national television in the United States, I don't actually know if lockdown made any difference. And, you know, that's really striking because, you know, the basic principle of medicine, I think it should be of public policy as well as first do no harm. Don't make an intervention unless you know for sure it's going to have a benefit. That's the whole essence of cost benefit analysis. So I'd be interested in your um, talking a little bit about how these models, is, I assume you usually have a range of different scenarios that come out of your modeling, which include both the magnitude of the impact and the likelihood of it happening. Um, how you would use that in actually relating to public policymakers, making sure that they're not focusing on worst case scenarios, making sure they're thinking about the, um, you know, the, the, the magnitude versus the likelihood of these sorts of, of things. I'll stop there. Yeah. I mean, great questions again, that how do we ensure that modeling predictions are not misused by politicians and that we are not biased in some subtle way by what we might want to see, what we think really is going to happen? Very hard. I mean, we have to sort of be very conscious of biases that we have and we have to remain really at arm's length from government, at least in that in, in that respect, we, sh we should be independent and be seen to be independent of modelers. I think there is work in India. I've written about this at various points about what I think about models and modeling relating to India. And I think the models I tend to trust the least are the ones that seem to be favor government lines a little more. I would tend to, to trust those who I see as being independent, even if they point out stuff that I don't necessarily like to see. Um, regarding, I mean, the points that you raised about Ferguson and the other models, et cetera, two points. One is that modelers produce a scenario and which they desperately hope will not happen. Nobody wants to see cases at the level of 400,000 per day, which happened 420,000 at the peak of the second wave in the country and attendant deaths. And, you know, this everything, every single airway was filled with pictures of this. So even if you predicted that, I mean, that's not what you want to see. You want government to act to not have that. And so you don't want to see that curve. That's a curve that you predict, but you hope desperately that, that people will see sense, will stay home, will mask, governments will shut down appropriately, not, not you know, be careful about what they do. So that the number of cases is just much more gradual than the sharpie that completely saturated healthcare systems in the country. So modelers have a funny sort of relationship with life. They desperately hope that what they predict is not going to turn out. On the other hand, everybody holds them to task because it didn't turn out that way. So, you know, it's, 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 it's a very, it's no other field has this particular problem, except maybe, I don't know, political polling or something, which, which again is, is, is another example. Um, the second point that I want to make is that imperfect information in modeling is also a problem that we, much of what happened in February, March, 2020, et cetera, was very, very fragmentary. We didn't have enough knowledge of what COVID-19 was doing, how exactly the risk of serious outcomes of COVID-19 went up with age. 
for example, the fact that, and that really is probably the most important thing, not even diabetes, not even cardiovascular disease, not asthma, et cetera, is really age. And the fact that it goes up very steeply, when, you know, it's far, the mortality for influenza versus uh, COVID-19 is the 40, 50 times different by the time you get to the 60 plus or 70 plus. And strangely for India, it seems to plateau out, for the, for the US, it seems to go up. We don't understand why these local distinctions exist. But that's, you're, you're modeling in a fog. You're bottling with imperfect information. You're going by what is happening in Italy with its older populations, in China, where you don't have enough information on this, out to one or two Chinese hospitals. And, it's, and you have to make do with that. And that's when, again, the point that we've been stressing repeatedly in public forums, that we need to have good data in the country. We need to make that data publicly available. The Indian Council of Medical Research should not hold that data to itself. It has now among the largest amounts of public data relating to vaccination, relating to testing. So what we'd like to know is if you were tested now positive and you caught the disease later, three months later, what fraction of people did that happen to? Do we know what fraction of people that happened to who got Omicron versus Delta? So what are the levels to which vaccine breakthroughs are happening? What are the levels of severity in these cases? The point is all this information is potentially there, but no one has seen it outside government, for one thing. The second thing is that a lot of the information is not there that should have been collected. So we need to improve our data collection systems in such a way that we can understand what parts of our population are more susceptible, are more likely to have adverse outcomes and targeted to them. Again, very important from a public health point of view to know this. You don't need, need to know the details of the population at all, be sort of addressing privacy questions. But you do need to do this if you're good to mount a better public health response than you did in the past and to be able to learn from that. But what about the implications of your interventions? I mean, uh, social isolation, uh, yeah. economic loss, learning loss, yeah. uh, uh, you know, just any other diseases that then are not inoculated for, yeah. or you know, you don't go to doctors. I mean, can that be built in? Because I think that that is really essential to knowing that can also be built in. Fact, in fact, our funders in the beginning were interested in question, economic questions. That look, can you put that economic decision making? into this in yeah. some way. Why people make economic decisions and can you factor that into how disease might spread? In principle, we could, but it's sort of complicated. Sorry. Yeah, sorry, go on. No, I just think that why don't we just collect the questions that you make yeah. so that um, sure. you know, you're not just collecting the questions that are there. Sure, just that I never remember them. Oh, I see, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I prefer to answer quick. Yeah questions right then and then we can sort of go through that. Yeah, we can talk later about this. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor Menon. It was a very interesting talk even for non-science people. I just want to understand a particular section of your talk, you know, what you call the synthetic population and the agent. I'm particularly intrigued by the photograph you showed that it's a photograph of nobody basically, right? Which uh, Prathama described as very real unreal. So what exactly is the relationship between a very real unreal and the real real, let's say. Why I'm asking this, you know, this reminds me of a very interesting experiment done in criminology. In late 19th, early 20th century England, Sir Francis Galton produced what he called a composite photograph. The idea was to identify what he called homo criminalis or the criminal man. There is a prototype of criminal man. So what he did is very interesting. He exposed one single photographic plate in front of 20 mug shots of convicted criminals. The result is that you have a very real face, but it's a face of nobody. Mm -hmm. right? The idea was to train police people through this uh, archetypal photograph so that they could immediately recognize a potential criminal. But the experiment failed because of its genericity. It was so generic that it didn't help anybody. In, in practice, it was basically not at all useful. I understand that what you are showing here is the relationship between this photograph and someone outside the photograph, not necessarily the same person, is not genericity. Then what kind of relationship do you assume between the synthetic population or its agent with a face and uh, the population which you are actually addressing? I understand that privacy and other concerns are also involved, but I'm 
trying to understand the relationship between the There's two. There's a quick and operational way of understanding that. When, when CSTS does surveys, it sort of looks, you know, demographic information. What is the male to female ratio, ages of participants, distribution, families, etc. So all of this is one column in each of these. So if I just looked at the distribution of men and women in my synthetic population, I should expect that to be bang on to the actual number that I would get if I went out and did a survey. If I looked at the fraction of people with cardiovascular disease, I would expect that to be bang on to what I would do if I went and did a survey on that population. If I looked at age distribution, I would expect that to be bang on to what I did if I did a survey. So all of this should be thought of as doing if I did a survey, I should be able to, in principle, find no difference on any one of those parameters between what I compute on my synthetic population and what I get by actually going and getting people to fill out the questionnaire. The subtleties is this, um, that make it difficult is if you want to create households and you don't do it in a sensible way, you might wind up with a household with four people all under five or are all under four. So that's where the clever computer science things come in, that you want to different parts of these columns to be realistic. You don't want a four-year-old with, with, with diabetes, necessarily with type 2 diabetes or something, who's, who, who's the head of a household and is earning 10 million rupees a year. These different columns also have to make sense with relative to each other. That's much harder to do. And that's where these machine learning techniques are better at generating things that look pseudo-realistic. I like in that, as in the example of that particular phase. There are many subtleties here that I've glossed over. And in fact, I'm not expert on these subtleties myself. I collaborate with computer scientists who work on this. But the operational way of thinking about the synthetic population is that whatever I calculate on that synthetic population, I end up, imagine doing exactly the same thing by asking the survey question. I should not be able to tell the difference. Okay. Uh, well, I want to, you know, come back to the uh, data question and uh, why there is no way out. Uh, we have to have data. Uh, why? Because your story starts with the Black Death and not before that, because I don't think we had data before that. And also the climate change thing is, you know, starts with the denial of data on climate change. And uh, here also, right? We denied it and then we blamed it on a certain uh, community uh, before, uh, we then we launched an app. App, once again, is the universal answer nowadays. Uh, uh, so you, you, ha you have an app, then you have a solution. We are also trying to create one. Uh, the question is, once again, is the question is of reliability of the app, right? And it has to be built over years, right? If CSDS data is relied more than other data, right? There's a certain credibility to it. Let's you know, take it to the, the, the Maharashtra example or Kerala example, right? Their data of death. And there's also a question of infection versus death data. No deaths happening in UP, for example, right? Very small infection happening. We, everybody knows that people are dying. Everybody knows that hospitals are full, but there's no data, right? And obviously, in the end, the narrative is they handled it pretty well much better than Kerala or Maharashtra, for example. So the wicked people are as important as Cliff was trying to say, as the wicked problem. So this reliability of this uh, data, uh, uh, this new face that you are trying to create, uh, also has, has to be done in a kind of, uh, you know, human, it's a process in which the interaction with the real humans uh, uh, is very important. The reliability factor has to be built into it before people start giving away their data and feel happy about uh, giving, uh, giving, giving it away to you. So how is that uh, going to be ensured? Yeah, no, that, that's a nice question. Um, you're right. I mean, quality of data certainly is an issue. It varies between states. It varies between you know, the which parties in power. It varies with the, the quality of, of health infrastructure in that state, the nature of reporting, et cetera. But remember that people who began to question the data count were doing it by triangulating in all sorts of interesting ways by looking at, at, at civil registrations of deaths, at other types of records, hospital records, very nice work from Gujarat, from the Gujarati newspapers on looking at the fact that there's complete disconnect, disconnect between numbers that were being seen by journalists interviewing people in there and in the, in the hospitals and morgues and the numbers that were being reported by the government. So one way is just, you know, independent journalism, which is certainly the only, pretty much the only way of making sure that there is some, some, some balance on these numbers. 
The second is better data methods. Remember that the, the projections for UP and other states said that there would be a larger number of cases than were actually there. Now, everything that we know about epidemiology would suggest that that had to be the case. You know, so there is a rigorous scientific and epidemiological understanding of what one might expect. Anything that's too far from that, you have to cook up all sorts of weird explanations for, and that not, you know, it's unlikely that even if you put in management, good management, you would get the stark discrepancies between the numbers on the ground and the actual numbers that you would predict. That's again where models are important because they tell you what is the range that you might expect. If you're not seeing that, you're likely not reporting right. So it's a test on reporting as well. It's, a, it's where the whole circle closes on that particular thing. Again, very good points. You, you know, data is like we've asked about, we've raised this data question in multiple things that, that I've written, that my colleagues have written. It's an important point, but I think doing a better job of modeling is itself a way of checking that the data is of good quality. But that cannot be replaced by the fact that we do need to create data of good quality anyway, as, as this country. I just wanted to uh, suggest following Cliff, whether it's not high time that the study of the relationship between data, social media, expertise, political power, itself becomes a field of study yep. uh, following. So it's not just about robustness of data and good data versus bad data, but all these things, uh, almost as if without this uh, parallel study or parallel dialogue, we'll be missing a hell of a lot of things and speculating about what happens. Yeah, absolutely, I agree. Um, sorry, we're getting we're getting more and more questions here. So the first question was um, from um, Atyab Zafar. A wonderful talk when you talk about agent-based models. There's many complex systems that use these agent-based models to study emergent properties. All of these models have some spatial movement involved in them. Are there any examples of the agent-based simulations that do not involve agents physically moving around the virtual or real space, but still one can study the interactions between agents? Okay, this is this is a question. And then there's two more. So you want to stick with this or you want to, what do you want to do? I, I, I oh, answer them one by one. It's just easier for me to remember what question is being asked. The answer is yes, you don't, you don't need to constrain the agents to move around. It's just in this particular example, you imagine them moving from home to workspace, just close school, etc. But what's really happening is that their networks are shifting. They have one set of networks at home, you shift that to another set of networks at work, a third set of sorry, networks in school. Sorry, uh, Gautam, yeah. the same person has said uh -huh. uh, an add-on. They're saying to elaborate. Maybe an example of an example could be something like this, the spread of fake news over social networks and the World Wide Web. Agents are not actually directly or actively moving. Yeah. What we would think about a network model where you have information coming into each of these nodes, the nodes are in quotes, either the nodes of a network or agents that don't move, whichever way you could consider. So you don't have to rewire any part of it. It's just that information comes in, is processed, is sent out again, and the properties of that agent, the, the variable associated with each of those nodes changes in some way. So you're completely right. There's no restriction. An agent doesn't have to move. For this, for this particular purpose, we imagine them moving in the sense of changing, switching their networks, which mentally we think of as, as, as something moving from point A to point B. We imagine this on the background of some geographical information system because it's easy to represent when you show, when you want to discuss the effects of a disease that this ward, this some other class, this district, et cetera, will have it worse than something else. So that spatial information that is there is useful to conceptualize the effects of the impact of a disease. But it doesn't need to be tied to that. It doesn't need to be tied to space at all. It's just for this particular application that it turns out to be important. Gosh, welcome to the matrix. Uh, here is uh, Riaz Tayyabji from uh, Ahmedabad. He says, greetings from Ahmedabad, Gautam. It occurred to me that one of the issues we face with what biological, ecological, and now data-driven uh, data driven thinking opens up is that we tend to approach these with deterministic expectations that really arose from our earlier understanding of physical systems. If cause and effect is no longer sufficient to understand phenomena, what then do you think is the relationship between our understanding them from 
these studies and the way we should engage, okay? Or is framing these situations like the pandemic as problems that we can solve still the predominant way of engagement? I hope my question is clear. Okay. okay so let me try and answer it as, as well as I, as best as I can. There are some things that we know are causal. I mean, we should not, we should not fool ourselves that nothing is causal in the world. If you catch COVID-19, you've been infected by the SARS-CoV-2 virus. If you're being infected by the SARS-CoV virus, you must have come into contact with at some level of proximity, someone who's already carrying it. So that information is there. Apart from that, the effort is to put as little as causal as possible, except what you can directly infer from actual data, actual behavior. What people do go to work, people do go to school. There's no causality assumption in that. This is what people do. And you can put that into the model and you can put the fact that disease transmits between people in the model because you know that's something that you know. So the parts of the science and the aerosol is harder. It's certainly, in principle, you could do that. You could sort of have a, a miasma that sort of surrounds people who are infected and someone come, that sort of dissolves after a while. That's also, so again, there's no technical issue with actually doing that. Um, so, okay, so I lost track on that question a little bit, but. <laughs> so you're saying if, if cause and effect is how we used to think about earlier problems. Yeah. Then we thought in terms of problems and solving those problems. Yeah. But now there's this whole business of wickedness introduces yeah. so, uh, an intractability. Yeah. Right? And I understand that that perfectly. So yeah. my point is, I did sort of think about this in an instrumental sort of way that you must do this and then something will happen, etc. But the point I emphasized right at the end was there's an understanding component of it. These are complicated, complex systems with many interactions. A little bit that we can understand, we can come away from them having understood them a little better. That I think is a step forward. You know, we'd, we'd like to say we will do useful things with this knowledge, but that may be too far from us right now. And I would settle even for a limited improvement in our understanding that incorporates this complexity. Um, I was just thinking in, in relation to what Boydik was, uh, and then we'll close after that. I think we have to, it's already 6.30. Um, but what Boydik was saying about uh, that original photograph of Homo criminalis, who was no real person, right? So, and the question he asked about genericity, I don't know if you even know if that's a word, but you, you see what that means. So I think, I think what, what we're getting at is that thinking in terms of archetypes, right? And prototypes, right? And this kind of a synthetic agent as being uh, archetypal, right? Has all of the dangers that we know from, let's say, the Nazi doctors, right? What is, a, or, or from any kind of like racist science that looks at populations uh, from a biological perspective to essentially describe them in terms that are racially specific or specific to their, you know, other vectors of identity, right? And then use that to act against them or to, or to control them in some way or to, to murder, murder them perhaps, you know, uh, if you're looking at concentration camps and so on. So, so there, the essentializing nature of a certain kind of exercise, right, is deeply problematic to the point it's so ethically problematic that you have to shut down that kind of 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 uh, of uh, uh, knowledge seeking or, or seeking of information because it, it's absolutely antithetical to any kind of uh, democratic assumption right um, on the other hand you do want you want to be generic, but you don't want to be archetypical. Something like this is the, is the philosophical problem there, right? That it has to be representative enough of enough real-time individuals and their behaviors and their networks. At the same time, it shouldn't essentialize, not only should it not identify any real person and be traceable to any real person, but it should not also essentialize properties or groups of properties to groups of individuals in ways that then lead to uh, very problematic uh, uses 
of that kind of information against particular groups like blacks or Jews or Dalits or any, any, anything that we can think of historically. D do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, I see what you're saying and I see that that is a potential source of, of, of I mean, for example, should we have, should we have caste as a column in, yeah. in, in this? Is that essential to anything that we need to, to understand? Is it relevant to public health or not? the sort of question, the public health question that one is asking. A priori, one doesn't know. One may have certain biases based on, on, on the biology that we understand that biologically, we're all fairly similar. We're all, this is a new virus to all of us. So there's nothing that predisposes one, one particular segment of the population more than anyone else. So, so, so let me, sorry, uh, Gautam, you know, I, I just want to, we have had this discussion here when we brought Tony Joseph, for instance, right? And he was, you know, his work and he was talking about uh, population genetics and, and, and uh, you know, histor historic prehistoric dem demography in a sense. And what we are learning more and more about the kinds of populations that constitute uh, the peoples of today's Indian nation state, right? And, and what does genetics have to do with, with our, current forms of identity conflict right um, and 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 so similarly i would think that in any such kind of a big data uh, operation which also has a biological component to it this danger remains very real and this is something that we are all concerned about right right that you know what is the value really of 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 the even if it's the most precise, if it's generic in nature, right? Is is are there certain dangers that you you know you just political dangers that you can't really avoid? Uh, and have you thought about those, you know, in terms that make sense for your modeling exercise, or would you be willing to think about them without thought, shutting down your project? No, I have thought about them, and yeah. I think it's certainly an important question to to, to ask. You do want your synthetic population to be accurate in the sense that I described, but there may be correlations in that synthetic population that suggest that one particular group of, of individuals may be more susceptible to heart disease than anyone else. If an insurance company got to know that, they could deny that, that group of individuals uh, coverage on the basis of that. That certainly is a worry. Um, I'm not sure how to... Or a pharma company, or or sort of all sort of caste questions and sort of localizations of caste in particular regions, etc. Yeah, and with with the, the colonial the, state, the you know caste was weaponized uh, yeah, through so through the through the census. I agree. So I, I mean, I sort of view this in the fact that there is again for wicked problem, there is no uniform solution. That there are that you have to take the good with the bad. If I can figure out that you know a genetic test done early enough on a fraction of the population can help to protect them against the consequences of a genetic disease that sets in later in life. That's, I think, an important bit of information that I, that I would, that is relevant to the health of my, of my people. So it's, you know, I have to, there are things that I gain and there are things that I sacrifice. And the only thing is sort of understand the moral and the ethical issues involved and to make sure that it's not misused. But you, you make these resources, they have information within them. You're not consciously putting that information in or out. Though you, for some columns, you might choose to hide them and not display them to the public. There is good that can come from it. There is bad that can come from it. And the only thing to do is to have that sort of moral compass that tells you and a sort of explicit moral statement about the uses of data such as that. I have no better answer than that. Anything else? Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Gautam Menon. And thank you to everyone present uh, in reality and uh, in the unreal real. Um, and um, uh, we hope we can continue this con conversation with you. Thank you very much for taking the time and for your very clear and um, uh, comprehensible <laughs> Um, um, presentation and, and uh, the way in which you shared your ideas with us. Thank you, Gautam. Thank, thank you, Ananya. Thank you, CSPS.